Time now for our Wall Street Week daily segment. The host of Wall Street Week, David Weston, joining us as he does every day at this time. David, a lot of great interviews that are featured on Wall Street Week. And I, I'm told that you had a chance to sit down with a couple of folks to talk about AI today. Yeah, back to yeah. AI, but from a slightly different direction. We have two people who wrote an article. It's out today, actually, in Foreign Affairs, talking about the geopolitics of it. Mm -hmm. What it's going to have to do to the, oh, the way we regulate and the way we structure this around the world. And it's written by Ian Bremmer. He's a Eurasian group. President and Mustafa Suleiman, Inflection AI co-founder. He's also the author of The Coving Wave, Technology Power in the 21st Century's Greatest Limit. That's coming out just in a week or two. And we talked to them, started talking about how big and how fast is this coming and what do the governments have to do about it. This is going to be the most important transformation of our lifetimes. I mean, think about it. Everything that has made us productive as a species. Um, is our intelligence. You know, everything around us is created because we have the ability to uh, simulate, to plan, to imagine. And now we're teaching machines to do the same thing. We have generative AI, we have many other machine learning tools now, which are getting better and better at producing great value in the world. And I think that is going to be the biggest turbo boost to productivity and invention and creation that we've seen uh, in the history of our species. This, this next couple decades are exactly the productivity boost that we need. Uh, Ian, we've seen uh, technological waves in the past. I mean, m perhaps one of the things we think about is the internet, which changed an awful lot of the way we conduct our lives, also changed the way governments react with one another, corporations do. Is this uh, the, the same sort of, of change or is this of a different kind? Well, it's similar in the sense that the internet in the virtual world, the digital world, technology companies are dominant. They're functionally sovereign in deciding how the internet functions, who gets to see what, how you interact, do you have a platform, do you not? Um, but with artificial intelligence, the influence and power that the digital world has over our lives in how we think, um, in what we're capable of doing as individuals, as corporations, as governments, um, in our national security, in our economic productivity, is increasingly being driven by these same technology companies. So it's, it's one thing to say the technology companies have control of something that's kind of marginal. It's another to say that they have control over something that is fundamental to how we think about power in the world. And if you want to regulate it and govern it, as Mustafa and I are saying is utterly essential and yesterday, that means that you're going to have to work together with the technology companies in creating these institutions and architecture. And that is something we've never seen before. Yeah, and I want to talk about the proposals you and Mustafa have in foreign affairs. But, but Ian, I, I'm curious about, as we go into this, are the incumbents likely to prevail, at least in the initial phases? And I mean that both in the private sector in terms of the really big tech companies, but also some of the countries that have rather than have not. I think we don't know. Uh, I mean, the fact is that uh, right now there are only a very small number of companies in two countries that are dominant players in AI. Uh, my co-author and friend Mustafa, uh, one of them uh, in that White House meeting with Biden just a couple of weeks ago, there were only seven represented. But this technology is expanding far faster than Moore's Law. It's 10x every generation as opposed to, you know, in a year, as opposed to 2x every two, uh, two years um, for semiconductor speed, for example, and reduction of price. And, and the proliferation of the influence of those models, not just in terms of what companies build them, but what individuals and organizations, some for good, some for nefarious purposes, will be able to drive this AI revolution within a matter of a very few years we're talking not about 10 actors or 100. We're talking about hundreds of thousands. Mustafa, the, cha the challenges for governance are just enormous, as you lay out with Ian in this foreign affairs piece out just today. Uh, but it strikes me that uh, any one government has a challenge in trying to catch up with technological change. We've seen that again and again and again. We're looking at something that needs to be, I think, global, given its nature. What are the basic approaches that should be taken, understanding that none of us, I don't think, perhaps not even you, knows actually where it's going to end up? 
Look, I think technologies are always very difficult to predict. By their very nature, they have emergent properties. When they interact with the world and they are actually used and they're then adapted, they change form and change shape. And they're doing that very, very quickly. So the challenge is really significant. But I think there are lessons that we can draw from existing processes. So, for example, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has been incredibly effective at bringing together a very, very diverse group of scientists scientists, civil society groups, academics, and of course, governments, to actually establish the scientific fact base for what is happening over a multi-decade period. And I think that we need something kind of similar for artificial intelligence. Think of it as an international panel on AI, and its primary job would be to be an independent, science-based, um, accurate assessment of the pace of change the strengths and weaknesses of these models, their constituent inputs, so the data that is used to train them, the chips that are used, uh, you know, that they train on. And that would, I think, help people to get some confidence that there is an independent expert body that is at least tracking progress. And finally, Ian, there's the multipolar issue that you lay out in your piece. There's also a bipolar issue, which, as I understand it, one of the things you're suggesting is we have to start with the United States and China, right where we are, because they're, in many ways, the two leaders on it. What are the uh, hopes and dreams that you have for the United States and China to come to anything approaching a framework jointly to address AI? Well, this is a, a question that the Bloomberg audience is going to particularly resonate with because AI is not like an arms race uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union, now the U.S. and China. It's much more like a structural uh, aspect of our global order that must be harnessed and can't be allowed to destroy everything we've built. In that regard, it's much more like the financial markets. And, and Mustafa and I suggest a techno-prudential approach to regulation, like the macro-prudential approach we have in the marketplace. Think of the Financial Stability Board, the IMF, the Bank of International Settlements. These are all organizations that the Americans, the Europeans, the Japanese, and the Chinese are a part of. And they are the reason they join is because they all want to identify and mitigate risks to global stability in the financial markets without choking off innovation.